Hi Cam followers, how are you all doing? Thank you for joining us again this evening. Um, I'm Nikki and I'm so thrilled to have Chirag on with us. Um, he is, as I'm sure many of you are already aware of who he is, but for those of you that don't know, he is a fantastic animal behaviourist. Um, so we are very, very lucky to have him on because he is a busy man. Um, he has many hats. Uh, you may have seen him um, on um on his Facebook page or on, on other things because he he is an, a behavior consultant he teaches behavior courses so some of you may have been to some of those courses he speaks at behavior conferences and he is um, often a behavior expert on various television programs as well so um, loads of things really really busy and we're so lucky that he's had the time to come on and speak to us this evening so I'm going to shut up because nobody wants to hear what I've got to say and pass straight over to Chirag um, and if you wouldn't mind just giving us a little bit of an introduction if people do have questions please please do put them down I will try and get to as many as we can but I feel like we're going to have quite a few this evening um, but do pop them down and we'll do our best so thank you so much for coming on would you like to um, have a chat about yourself please sure thank you for having me I think this is such an amazing um, a cause and um, educational um, what do you call it like educational Thing that you guys are doing because it's helping so many dogs and i think it's just something we don't generally tend to think about unless um it's brought to the forefront of our minds um mm. as to how to consider pain behavior how as our dogs age um things change for them and how can we better help them live so thank you so much for having me and i also just before i talk a little bit about myself i see loads of friendly people saying hello in the f uh, chat so <laughs> say hello back. um recognize so many names um so I'm a behavior consultant. I started working with um, dogs about 17 years ago, and it was a little bit random um, in terms of we've got a German Shepherd. He bit some people, got me interested in training. I was already volunteering at vets at the weekends, um, and um, I originally wanted to be a vet, so I had that interest. And taking him to training classes, working with him, helping him. At the vets, he used to try and bite everyone. So I um, had to try and teach him to be calm while we're doing a blood draw or teach him to wear a muzzle. So those kinds of things got me interested. And then the vet record, there was an advert for a dog psychology course. And I was only like 15, 16, I was thinking I was like 16. Um, and I thought, oh, dog psychology course, 90 pounds or something. And so I went home and asked my parents for a check and they sent a check off um, and they sent me this <laughs> folder. And I've actually got the folder up here on my bookshelf. And oh, I just went through the folder, filled in like five little case studies which for a few sentences each. And they sent me a certificate in dog psychology. And um, I was then able to, I like, my, the vets, I'd always be talking about behavior and training at the vets because I was getting yeah. into it. And so they were like, oh, you've got your certificate in dog psychology now. Why don't you run puppy parties or help some of our clients? So on Saturday morning before we open practice, um, I used to um, use the practice to run puppy parties and see clients and things like that. Um, That's but, amazing. Yeah, it kind of just started off like um, in that way. And then yeah. I've gone into kind of working with different species, um, everything from uh, sort of beluga whales, um, dogs, dolphins, um, zoo animals. Um, and then my passion is just to use behavior science um, ethical, practical uh, behavior science to improve the lives of the animals we care for because our animals really don't have a choice to live with us. And no. so we choose what they eat, we choose if they get vet care, we choose if they have sex, if they play, we choose everything about their lives. And yeah. so I think trying to find ways to give control back, um, improve their lives, kind of go, what can I do for you um, is what I'm passionate about. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds amazing. I just don't understand how you have enough hours in the day to do all of those things. <laughs> it just, like, I just do this whale and then I'm going to come and do this dog. <laughs> yeah, sometimes you're working um, uh, slightly longer hours, but I, I think it's just so much fun. It's For me, it's a hobby and something I do day to day, so I'm really lucky, so I can't really complain. And I think that's the best way, though, isn't it? And I think you can viewers can always tell or clients can always tell when it is something you're really passionate about because they you you just get a much better service from that person, don't you? So you yeah, genuinely yeah. believe um, that you know, as you said, that this is what you want to be doing, and it's your hobby uh, as yeah. well as your job, which is just fantastic. Um, so this evening we are going to talk about um, a few things and, and I know that there's going to be loads of questions as, as we go through. Um, but what I wanted to first talk about were some of the common presentations um, of pain related behaviours 
that you see um, or that you feel are, are just more prevalent? Um, and also some of those behaviours that we may misconceive as naughty behaviours or different behaviours, but that, that could be um, behaviour, uh, pain-related behaviours. Yeah. So would you like to just start and talk about what you would consider, what would be your list of the most common behaviours associated with pain? Sure. Sure. So um, there's some common ones like seeing um, with dogs walking slightly abnormally, um, or I say quite abnormally, depending on how observant we are. And so mm -hmm. if you see a dog walking lame, you might go, oh, there's something wrong. Um, you might see your dog sleeping a lot more. Um, you might see that when um, your dog is got like a sad face or a guilty face, um, they just sort of seem really de more depressed than they might normally be. Um, yeah. And so a lot of people uh, spot those as quite obvious signs in terms of pain. And then if there's things like vomiting or their dog has um, diarrhea or um, their dog starts to suddenly behave differently. So for some people, um, it could be um, normally the dog's okay, but now they go to give the dog a cuddle and the dog growls at them. And so if their dog's no never done that before, people might go, oh, why, what's changed? And some mm. people might relate that to pain, but for other people, they might just relate that to a naughty dog. Um, and so I would put that into kind of maybe both categories, something that's quite common, but maybe be something that's maybe mislabeled and so yeah. if the dog does growl they're trying to communicate often something it's not them being naughty or stubborn um the dog's just trying to say something we don't understand what it is so often we think oh don't do that because we've been told um don't let your dog growl at you because he might become dominant all of that but actually in fact we know that's a lot of nonsense um the science doesn't support a lot of the dominance theory and all of that so i think uh, when our dogs do growl they're kind of saying um that either I want distance or I want space or maybe I'm in pain or discomfort. The other thing um, to look out for are, um, like I said, sudden changes in behavior. So if your dog behaves in a certain way and then overnight they're behaving differently, for me that would be a big red flag to go, mm -hmm. oh, I need to go to the vet or so speak to a vet. The other things I, if I see multiple things happening, so with a dog, if I've got a dog who starts to show signs of, I don't know, they've got noise sensitivity, but then they also um, suddenly get scared of different things or become anxious of certain things. Um, the dog becomes funny around their food maybe. And you see three or think four things happening that you go, yeah. wow, there's so much I have to deal with. It's not just I have to train one thing or I need to see a behaviorist about one thing, but there's lots of red flags popping up all over the place. Again, I, I tend to find that there's usually something maybe more medical going on in those situations as opposed mm. to just change in behavior because um something else has changed externally yeah yeah and um, i mean i think that's that's really important actually because um, a lot of those behaviors that you were mentioning there if it is just a one-off it can be confusing and you may automatically just think okay I've, I've got a bad a bad dog here um but then you almost have to force yourself to look for some of those other behavior changes i guess just to see if it is just that one or if there's a, other things that are contributing to it um so yeah just one it's not it's often not just one behavior when you look back and think about it you probably will find other little things that were were clues i suppose wouldn't you yeah. Hindsight's an amazing thing. Um, and yeah. it's always those tricky, I call it like call them tricky things because um, like sometimes dogs go on walks and they stop walking on um, on the lead or they go, I don't want to go in this direction or uh, through a walk, they just sit down and people start going, oh, he's just stubborn or he's just got a lot of character. He's just got a lot of personality. And um, that might be true. And your dog I'm sure has a lot of character and personality and all of those things. But actually a lot of times for me, um, there could be other reasons why your dog stops in the yeah. street, right? but pain can be one of those and if you're uncomfortable then you tend to stop and um it could also be uh, jumping up people go oh my dog jumps up he's being naughty or he just wants attention but jumping up is mm -hmm. one of those behaviors they do for many reasons and if a dog's in pain then you might go wait if he's in pain why would he jump up that doesn't make sense but if yeah. you're in discomfort and you're trying to seek attention and your the human's face is all the way up here and the human hands are all the way up here then you might jump up as you're jumping something's hurting so you're trying to get away from that thing that's probably hurting you yes so you're trying to seek attention from your person and so that may look like um the more i jump potentially i try and get the human to help me and i don't know what's causing me pain either so you, that explains why sometimes you get behaviors that are like jumpy uh, or mouthy behaviors of dogs dogs who are extremely mouthy sometimes i find yeah. there might be a pain related component there so there's a few more things for people to think about uh with mm. behaviors mm. so one of the so i guess that would be one of the 
the misconceptions, wouldn't it? One of the missed behaviour signs when they're sort of mouthing, you think, you know, they're just being naughty. Because I wouldn't really think of that necessarily as a as a pain one. Um, but yeah, you're right. They, they're, t they're trying to tell you something, aren't they? And it's, yeah, completely yeah. makes sense, really. I mean, we were talking, when I spoke to you before, we were talking about what we what you were calling the manners, which you kind of just touched on there as, as well. Um, so like when you're going to cross the road with your dog, you may have taught them to do it in a certain way. Do you want to just go through what we were, what you were saying about that, like making them sit and that kind of yeah. thing? Yeah, sure. So I think it's really interesting. Um, the kind of words we use, I think it's really important because um, a lot of times we think we give our dogs commands or I make my dog do this, I make my dog do that. And essentially, um, that's kind of more old fashioned thinking in terms of um, from a training perspective, like commands are coming from the army. And so you're given a command, you have to respond or else. So it's almost like a threat, essentially, if you don't do this. And that's how I started training. If I told my dog to do something, they didn't do it. There'd be a negative consequence um, and they'd have to do it like I pushed their butt down or things like that. And, um, but the reason why I think of it so differently now, I, I think of it as asking the animal um, and um, I'm going to ask you, but also I'm going to listen to what you have to say. So if I ask you to, if we get to a curb um, at the at a road and I ask you to sit, if you don't sit, um, I'm not just going to say bad dog. I'm going to ask you or I'm going to start looking and asking the environment uh, what's different today? Why doesn't my dog want to sit? And it could mm -hmm. be because it's raining. It could be because there's glass on the floor. It could be because the dog sat about 30 times on the walk so far, um, every curb you've come to. And you might have a young puppy or an older dog. And imagine if, you, um, if, you're, if you've got arthritis yourself and you have to constantly get up, sit down, get up, sit down, get up, sit down, get up, sit down. It's going to become slightly painful. And so you might choose to go, I'm just going to stay sitting or I'm just going to stand up. And so when it comes to teaching our dogs, um, you will, if you, uh, manners or just different behaviors, one of the things I always think about is how can I teach it in a way that's ethical? Now, not just in terms of ethical as in I'm using positive reinforcement. So I'm motivating my dog with things that um, potentially like treats and toys when they do the behavior that's going to make the behavior, hopefully ha ha uh, help the behavior happen again. But mm. I'm thinking about um, if I teach my dog or my young puppy to sit at every single curb, then when I get to a curb and the dog's old and the dog's been doing this for seven or eight years, when they get to a curb and sitting is uncomfortable for them or it be starts becoming painful, it's going to put a them into a lot of conflict because they want to sit because that's what gets them rewards or yeah. uh, that's what uh, gets them the good dog. However, it's also uncomfortable at the same time. And so I think when we're teaching behaviors like curb behaviors, what I taught my dog was when you get to a curb, uh, you plant your feet, you just stop. Now the dog can choose whether they they get paid if they sit, they get paid if they lie down, they get paid if they stand. And so uh, all I want is a dog gets to a curb and they just hold their uh, body. Yeah. And so now as my dog gets older, and my dog is 12 now, when he gets to a curb, he can choose a standing is most comfortable. Or if I'm hanging around too long, then a sit or a down might be comfortable. So that way we encompass when we're training behaviors with our dogs, we provide choice and we think about their long term health and their long term physical um, abilities. And we train for those as well. Um, and it's the same for jumping up. So we're, we're jumping up. I don't teach my dog sit. I teach four feet on the floor. So when you greet a human. You can be stand. You can be in a stand mm. position. You can be in a sit position, a lie down position. So uh, we don't cause any kind of problems, and we can't always like if you're teaching an older dog or even a young puppy when they're young and their joints are developing. How good is constant sits for them? I don't know the answer. I'm just, one of, there's some theories out yeah. there that suggest that maybe it's not such a good thing. As a vet, you might be able to advise more. Yeah, I think you're right. The 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 old way like when i first qualified and we did the puppy parties and that kind of thing um yeah it was all there's one way to do this and we every dog needs to know how how to do that but um i think that's really interesting what you said because actually when we're training puppies not that i've i'm not a trainer i'm not behaviorist but as a vet um you know we often see puppies that go to those classes and the obedience and they're learning to sit and do whatever but we're only thinking about what they're doing then and even if they can do it as puppies i'm sure and many people and i i definitely will admit to this i haven't thought about how they're going to carry on doing those behaviors as they get older mm -hmm. so i think that's i mean that's a huge thing actually for, for me to think about is that we need to give them choices almost for so they they know they've got to do something but it can be a variation of the yeah. theme i suppose 
definitely. Yeah, definitely. yeah. And because a lot of these arthritic dogs, um, they are programmed to become arthritic, aren't they? You know, they, they this is always going to happen to them. It's nothing that you're doing. And so there's some of those changes that we get arthritic uh, dogs of all ages. And some of those changes may well be there yeah. as a pup. Um, so you're right. We should be doing this right from the beginning, shouldn't we? And, and I think that has changed quite a lot in the in recent years. Yeah, um, and, and I hopefully think it will continue to. Definitely. And I think um, training is one of those interesting things for me. For me, I look at training as a conversation. So mm -hmm. um, you speak, but you also listen. And when I say listen and speak, I don't necessarily mean with our mouth or with our ears, but yeah. we listen with our nose, our eyes, everywhere where we're seeing things in the environment, the dog's behavior, and that's giving us information. Um, and we're also talking through our actions and our treat delivery and what we ask the dog to do. And I think that's what training's about. So if we're just going sit, sit, down, down, stand, do this, do that. I'm not saying don't teach your dogs these things that, that you're it's fine but maybe don't yeah. overdo them but when you're doing them also maybe just be asking the question if i ask my dog to sit or my dog when i um if i ask my dog to sit he always lies down now that could be a learning thing it could be the dogs learn that uh, well it's all learning but the dog could have been taught that um, i get more treats for lying down so whenever you mm -hmm. say something they lie down but it could also be the animal trying to communicate something in terms of actually i'll go into this one because it's the most so comfortable position yeah. so i think yeah. it's really worth looking for those little signs um yeah and we've mentioned puppies i think i just wanted to mention before i forget that when we when we're teaching these basic obedience or we're teaching anything uh we often think a puppy must be healthy because um they're young they've just got them and for a lot of people you've invested all this money um time you've found a good breeder uh, but that doesn't mean um that there couldn't be like a little bit of injury when the puppies are in their litters or if they've been playing too much they might pull a muscle or something could happen yeah. And so a number of puppies that I see that sometimes um, who do a lot of play biting or they might start growling around their food. Um, they could be like moody puppies, people describe them as. Um, again, I would, I would ask you to question, um, could there be a medical component? Not, not necessarily pain, uh, but yeah. pain could be one of those things. Um, and then there could be other and it's things. Not, like it might not be a permanent. When you're in those, those situations, you're not talking about arthritis. You're just talking about... Yeah like asked if you sprain your ankle or something, which is easily exactly. done when you're a puppy bounding around at 100 miles an hour. So, yeah, yeah. And they might not, you know, pups are, are quite resilient, aren't they? They may not be limping. It, it may just be that, yeah, they they come across as stubborn or grumpy, yeah. <laughs> but it's not, there's something going on there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, um, yeah, that's quite an eye-opener, actually, just to think about when you're training your pups that um, this is for life, isn't it, what you're teaching mm -hmm. them? So to think about what they can do when they get older as well. Um, and then when you um, when when we're talking about more of this, I guess the arthritic dogs, we tend to think as older dogs and majority of them are. Um, how would you go about if they are showing different behaviours um, or unwanted behaviours or just those stubborn things like they're not sitting at the curb? If you had already taught them to do that, how would you then go about retraining or rejigging your routines with them so that because we all know that dogs love a reward they love a challenge and they love to succeed you know they thrive on succeeding don't they and and pleasing you so how would you go about then changing that so a number of things so first one is i would definitely look at um, working with different experts, so like a physiotherapist, a vet, a vet maybe who's got a special interest in pain, um, a trainer, um, and again, a trainer and a behaviorist maybe who are interested in uh, pain. And so um, bringing those people together, you start to see things from different lenses. Um, now with my own animals, things I might uh, consider doing is looking at, am I walking too much or um, are they not getting enough little bit of opportunity to stretch their legs if they're starting to get older or getting arthritis. I might think about what are the challenges um, that my dog could face. So um, if I've got do a dog bed, um, then I might provide a few different options. I might have an orthopedic dog bed, but then I also might have a dog bed which is slightly thinner, like a vet bed type thing. But then I might have a third option 
that's a different material. And um, we know that when we wear different clothes or when we sit on different chairs, uh, for some some people in a room, they can sit on a chair and go, why, this is comfy for me. But for someone else, five minutes into it, going, oh, this is not comfy. Mm -hmm. And so because pain can be quite subjective in terms of how it feels to that individual, and it's not the same experience for maybe every individual uh, with pain, um, I think uh, by providing options, we can start to learn what might be more comfortable for our dogs. And so yeah. uh, mates are definitely one of those things that I look at. And also, um, if I've got a bed that's round, um, then potentially if I've got a dog who's in slight pain, they might want to just lay flat. So I try and make sure the dog's bed is one that is big enough that the dog can lay completely flat. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. so they've got different options. The other things I think about are food bowls. So if I feed my dog in a food bowl, when I feed them, um, is the floor now too slippery for them? So if you've got a laminate or tiled flooring um, and my dog's eating and they're older and they've got arthritis, maybe they've got muscle wastage, then they're not going to have the physical ability to hold themselves upright as, bet, as, uh, as good as they were maybe a few years ago. Yeah, um, and yeah. so I would maybe think about feeding on a more comfortable surface or raising the food bowl up so it's at a comfortable height for the dog. Um, yeah. thinking about things like uh, when I take them for a walk, um, putting a harness on. Now, if I'm putting a harness on, and I'm used to putting like lifting one paw up and then lifting the other paw up. Um, now, lifting that paw up, the dog may take more time to adjust and stabilize their body weight onto the other three paws. So when I'm um, having an older dog or a dog who might be in slight pain, I'm starting to raise their paw. I just do it with, well, I, th I think we should give the animals respect to do this with every animal. But as they get older, I think we need to take, pay a little bit more attention to when we start raising their paws and they have to weight shift. We give them that moment to do it's that, time. whether that's a vet yeah. exam or whether that's at home, wiping them down after a, a walk. Um, and being careful to understand how a dog actually physically moves. And I say this for trainers or behaviorists or vets, it's obvious, but for maybe if you're um, you're not experienced or you're not a professional, you might pull the dog's leg sideways when you try and wipe them, but that's not how a dog's leg is designed to be moved. And so potentially yeah. you le move the uh, leg forward or uh, slightly backwards instead, and yeah. wipe it instead. So thinking about how we manipulate the body parts so they're most comfortable for that dog. And when we do that, like remember, it's a conversation. So as you're starting to move that paw up, um, I'm looking, I'm, I remember I said, listen, and we listen with how it feels. So what I'm doing is going, as I'm starting to lift, if I start feeling the dog tenses up or the dog is struggling to balance with that leg, I start to adjust. Um, I might put the leg back down for a second so that I'm listening to the dog all the way through. Grooming, mm -hmm. I might adjust how I groom my dog. So as my dog gets older, if they're arthritis, um, grooming them on certain body parts might be slightly sore. So as I'm grooming, I'm watching the dog's body. And if the dog starts to start yawning a lot, lip licking, or they start to walk away, or I start to groom towards the rear end and they start to go into a sit, um, that might be them um, kind of shielding or defending a certain body part. And so then rather than going, stand still, stop it, or just putting the lead on them, I might go, one sec, maybe I need a different kind of brush. Or yeah. maybe I need to give them a few days between brushings. If I groom yes. them every day, maybe I need to only groom them once every three or four days so it's not too sore for them. Or maybe I just do really light touches um, with the brush. Um, yeah. And then... Um, equipment so when i'm walking the dog am i walking them on a collar or a harness um now harness isn't necessarily in my opinion better uh, better or worse um because a badly fitted harness could just be awful for a dog with arth arthritis i think yeah. um and I, a lot of harnesses kind of either sit very low down and the dog can't even physically move their legs properly or they yeah. unbalance them and so i think when we're using equipment just because a harness doesn't mean we're being kind i think start to look at um first of all how does my dog walk without any equipment on and then second of all when i put a harness on how does my dog's movement change and if the, if it changes dramatically so your dog's not stretching their legs out uh, far enough when they've got a harness on that tells you potentially the harness is restrictive, restrictive. Right. yeah uh, so yeah so um there's some of the things i start to think about adjustment wise flooring making sure there's non-slip flooring around my house yeah. so yeah. Um, there's really cool companies that do like flooring for your houses that um, have more grip. Um, so yeah. I think um, I've recently just bought new floor. I, I was saying to you, my house is flooded. So um, I'm just having the flooring done. And I'm really happy actually in one way that because now for you Cody, change it. exactly, I'm installing yeah. a floor that has more grip. Um, and and so you I'm can really always, happy. we sell some of the um, non-slip stuff in the cam shop as well. And that, oh, I think that's probably one of the best sellers. 
um, because it is something that we talk about a lot, flooring yeah. um, and, and slippery floors just being so terrible. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, there's lots, there are lots of options. So even if you can't afford to get your house flooded and then redo it, <laughs> you, can always, <laughs> you can always buy things um, that, will, that will help your dog through that. So yeah, it is, a, it is a really important one. And I think going back to what you were saying about the harnesses, um, or the leads or whatever it it's really dog specific isn't it it's going to be on an individual individual basis because when you say an arthritic dog that yeah that's fine but it's going to be that arthritis is going to be different for every single dog in yeah. what joints it is how many joints are affected how long they've had that pain for muscle wastage and just you know what you've already been doing with them and what they can cope with so it is going to be a really individual thing isn't it but I think some of those things you were saying basically listening and watching your dog and looking at their gait with and without harnesses that it can give you so much information and maybe just you just need to slow down a bit I guess don't you and yeah. take it all in yeah definitely uh, I think slowing down what you just said is a key because as soon as you slow down I think you see so much that you don't get to see otherwise yeah yeah it's quite we we spoke to Gemma Hodson last week who I know you're you're aware of as well she's great um, yeah yeah, she's so lovely. She's already said hello to both of us in the comments there as well. Um, but she was talking about free work last week, um, which really gives you that time to watch your dog. Um, and if anyone didn't watch that, go back and, and look at it. And she showed a little video of, of the free work um, and what that involves. And the amount of information you can pick up just is amazing, really, just spending that time and giving them options to do different things. Mm -hmm. so that you can see wh which things they're preferring so like you were saying with the beds put a bunch out and see and it might vary from day to day but it's important to give that choice isn't it yeah. the most yeah. definitely i think the more a variety you provide and the more you slow down and you just start to look you suddenly see things that you hadn't seen before and um when you start listening to people like Gemma, yourself um all the different people that come on um the cam uh facebook uh, live feeds um what i found is you start going oh i just learned something then when you watch your dog you suddenly see your dog with a whole new set of eyes that you hadn't seen before yeah. so i definitely yeah. think it's worth listening to as many different people and going on like your i love your youtube channel because there's so many cam interviews on there and when you yes. start listening to them you start going wow i just learned something i didn't know yeah. it just improves our dog's lives so i would re re recommend people check out some of your other live interviews i found them so useful yeah yeah, um, that's uh, that's what I do as well. My weekends, especially during lockdown, oh, I'll just watch another cam live because even as a vet, you know, we don't know we don't know everything, but far from it. And you do learn something pretty much every time, at least one thing from every live mm -hmm. that, that you watch. Um, and it was also interesting when you're talking about picking dogs' feet up because I've I've noticed probably more so since I've been more involved with cam and doing more arthritis clinics, but. I probably spend more time when I'm doing my clinical examination now lifting each foot up more slowly and watching how the body adapts yeah. so if you have got a really sore leg and you pick up their good leg you i do it very carefully and like you've said you have to kind of work out which direction is the most comfortable and then i have to give them time to sort of shuffle their other legs around just to make sure that they're not going to fall over and it gives you so much information you think oh now this is actually this is where the problem is um or if they can't get comfortable then there's multiple things going on so these are all things that you can start to look at at home as well, can't you? And and talk to your vet and your behaviourist and your physios about things that you've noticed as well. Yeah, and I love that, Nikki. I love the fact you look at what a lot of people see as a difficult dog or see as um, just a fidgety dog or see as maybe a dog who they um, need to just hurry up and get on with it. You see mm. all that information. And I think that's so valuable because like working at the vets early on, and this was a long yeah. time, but I remember like vets don't necessarily have the longest time to do consults. No. Thing, but sometimes things are like you, you have to get things done. But sometimes if you um, you're almost it's not scared like scared to let go because like you've got a dog in a certain position a blood draw position you're gonna lift their head neck up and they start to move you'll put a butt stop behind their butt but actually yeah. maybe um what the dog is trying to do is just go i'm just getting comfortable for a second and yes. so um actually um and what i find is um when i'm working with vets and vet staff often i say is sometimes with the animals if you actually give them that moment to readjust they actually become more confident and more yeah. uh, happier for you to touch them because they've just gone like oh you listened oh yeah oh, i actually like you as opposed <laughs> the to the relief yeah 
And so when yeah. I take my dog to a vet, so I don't know if you're doing like a, they're going to catheterize him for something or they're going to yeah. do a blood draw from the front. Um, if his leg goes out and he starts to fidget, I was like, could we just stop for a second? They're like, oh no, we've just raised a vein. I was like, actually, it's fine. We just stop for a second and then yeah. um, give him a moment. The second time, he'll just let you do it. Whereas if yeah. you try holding on, then you get into a fight, and then the next time you go mm-hmm. back, it's going to be a bigger fight, and then the third time, the dog because might they not it. Yeah, exactly. yeah, definitely. And I find with some dogs when they are you know really bad, and you have to put a catheter in, or their their neck or back is too painful that you can't go under the jugular to get the bloods, which is where we normally try and get blood samples from. You have to go for a leg, and sometimes you can't even you shouldn't or you shouldn't lift that leg up because it is going to distress them and there are ways you know it's just mm-hmm. like you said you know the communication with the dog and listening and just adapting yeah. and making sure that that you have got the time to do it and booking enough time when you've got especially arthritic dogs and i know um we've got these bandanas that you can put on your dog or on your lead and and i love i it's very occasionally this happens um that a dog comes in into the hospital and they've got a bandana that says i'm arthritic and it oh. then it just tells everybody doesn't it all the nurses and the receptionists and the vcas the care assistants that you need to you can't just go in and take this dog quickly out of a kennel you have to be careful more careful obviously you have to be careful with every single dog that you're, you're getting out of a kennel but be more aware that this dog might be quite painful and if it does snap at you it's trying to tell you something that you know you might have just touched it in the wrong place so yeah just making everyone aware that, that's dealing with your dog there's no harm in that really that's just to make it, sure you uh, you saying those things got i just popped a thought up in uh, my head um so you can communicate with my mind um you're amazing <laughs> um so when you're saying that what popped up in my head was um the idea of um shifting position so um say you've got a dog in a waiting room or you're going to take your dog to the vet so you're a groomers or um you've got a trainer coming around one of the things i often find is people behave differently because you're at the vet you want to just make sure the vet doesn't see your dog as a naughty dog or um yeah. you're like you're, you're you might be a little bit stressed as, the, as a caregiver so when you go in you stand up you sit, get off the chair and your dog might be lying down or sitting and sometimes the floors aren't necessarily the most grippy floors at the vet because for it's high Evening, and yeah, so you yeah. come up and you go let's go rover and the vets or the nurse has got the door open or they're they they come to greet lead you as as, as they're walking away uh, you almost give your dog a bit of a nudge or might speed up and the dog's just like whoa what i just need a moment yeah, and so yeah. even that little the way you enter the vet room or the consult room or the groomers or um you meet someone if you get the dog out of the car and you're like normally you get the dog out of the car and maybe you let them get out a stretch a little bit but because you have the vets you might be running late for your appointment you get the dog out the car and you just start marching and this dog who might have slight discomfort doesn't even get a chance to stretch or do any of this so you get trigger upon trigger upon trigger so by uh, or like um, you almost stack little negatives on top of each other so by yeah. the time you get into the vet room and the vet wants to touch the dog no wonder why the dog is way more likely to react negatively and it's yeah. and then people are like what do i do in this situation well it's not what you do in that situation there's a lot you can do in that situation but what you want to do is actually go back a few steps and start to do the whole thing differently so if i take my dog to the vet i i try and make sure okay i'm in a rush but i'm gonna when he comes out the car i'm just gonna take a deep breath give him a chance to stretch and then mm-hmm. as we walk in, and as a vet comes out and my vet's amazing because we've been working on so now she'll be like oh that's okay just give him a moment i take his bed in so i put his bed down on the floor and he's sitting on that as opposed to just the flooring so when we yeah. get up I, I stand up and i wait for him to be fully ready to walk before i just start moving and in the mm-hmm. vet room i put his bed down so he's got a, 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 um, a comfy floor um that he can lie on or he can stand on um and then um that's really helped and the vet, my vet loves it now because initially it was like i was just like could you just wait a second i just want him to be ready <laughs> before you touch him and now years later it's just like oh cody is such a great dog when he comes in we can get everything done really quickly he's calm yeah exactly so it'll make a big difference if we work on yeah that. so taking that little bit of extra time actually then shortens the whole procedure yeah. afterwards yeah it makes perfect sense doesn't it i think that's a really good tip actually if you if you are having problems or you're worried just yeah take your own mats come in and nobody's going to mind everyone's going to be happy with that i mean we've we've we found this a little bit over lockdown actually that we we have to stop people coming into the practice and so we have to take dogs in without their owners um and some of them i think it's stressful for everybody and dogs of course pick up on your stress don't they as well we we know that happens and um, and there have been times where the dog refuses to come in and 
we just go, you know what, that's okay. Let's go around to the car park and do this in the back of the car. That's okay. In the summer, that was fine. In the snow, it's not It's not quite so great. But um, yeah, it's just listening and adapting. Yeah. And I think it, that's, that's really important. And never be afraid to ask your vet or wherever you are, can we do this outside or could yeah. you could you just wait a minute? I've got to get my mat out from the car. Nobody's going to mind. Everyone's happy to make sure this is a positive experience or as positive as it can be for your dog. No, definitely. Um, I just wanted to to touch on another little thing. And um, you know, with with um, older dogs, I commonly see older dogs coming in, and people will say, "Oh, well." This kind of goes back to what we were talking about: sitting at curbs or asking them to do things that they don't want to do anymore um, and people come in and say well, I'm not going to make him do that anymore because he, he's older I'm just not going to I'm, I'm not going to push it which is fine but um, we're always talking about if your older dog is unable to do as much physical activity or as many of those sort of behaviors or that training that you had initially done with them I feel like we should still replace that with something else Oh, yeah. rather than just say it's because they're old and we just won't make them do it so for me I always think it's like my dad who is you know, he's not ancient but he doesn't go jogging anymore but he does his sudoku every morning in the newspaper yeah. and I feel like we need to do stuff like that for our older dogs as well would you would you agree what would you suggest 100 percent. so i think uh we know that um well there's some research coming out or there's lots of there's research out that shows with alzheimer's and things like that there could be with humans um there could be um long like it could help with cognitive decline by having puzzles and things that they engage in um and so same with dogs i think it could be really good to uh give our dogs the opportunity to um, maybe have puzzle feeders so again you but you just be careful so if you've got a dog who is sore you may not want them to be jumping around like crazy so you might have a feeder where they can lie down calm and lick like a licky mat or um a feeder that doesn't move around too much but for other dogs, um, actually having gentle walking around. So where Gemma talked about free work, if you set up free work on a comfortable surface, you could have spoonfuls of food or you could have a couple of bits of food on different places. So the dog can just mooch around and go to whichever area they want and just eat little bits slowly as they're moving. But it's on a comfortable surface. It's not causing them to be jumping up and down too much, they're not running around like crazy. So yeah. uh, any of those. And then using training in terms of teaching um, little games or little behavior so you can do hand targets that doesn't necessarily mean the dog's moving around too much but if you've got, got a dog who touches your hand when you say touch they say touch and the dog oh, we can't see you say touch and the dog <laughs> moves their nose to the hand the reason i like that is because if i've got a dog who um i take um or slightly getting older i can say touch and the dog does this i can say touch and the dog does this and now what we're doing is they're allowing movement yeah in the neck so if i just do a, a calm move your paw forward slightly then i'm able to teach my have my dog be able to um exercise certain body parts that they weren't able to exercise before or maybe they yeah. stopped exercising because they're not yeah. doing as much exercise anymore um and then the other thing i recommend to people is i print off like one of those um just like a basic child's uh, uh outline of a dog and um as i'm working my dog through this i keep a little diary so if i do um like an ear touch or i do ask my dog to stretch his paw out i'll put a little score between one and ten or one and three so one being um maybe really slow didn't do it 10 being does it really enthusiastically and over um the sessions if i notice it change i go oh today's um the dogs i'm getting ones and fours whereas okay. normally i get sevens and tens so maybe it tells me that some days my dog doesn't want to offer his paw as much or stretch out yeah. his back or his front paw and then that could tell me maybe is there something happening with pain so he's more painful or if the weather's too cold or yeah. if i've been if i walk my dog for two hours and suddenly i find that um his scores change and so by keeping these scores we start to start seeing patterns and we can start to go oh i can speak to my vets and the vets might be able to go oh maybe if you do if your dog does end up walking here then you might change the dose slightly of uh, med yeah. medication or pain medication or you might adjust pain medication uh based on um the dog's lifestyle changes as well um yeah. if that has to happen or you might adjust to walking so the dog doesn't walk as much so i think it's really worth like observing and maybe even scoring yeah yeah, I guess it's, you know it's kind of like the good day, bad day that things that we we always talk about as well. But it's a little bit more in depth because you're scoring rather than just a, yeah. a good or a bad day. But yeah, that's um, it, it is uh, the other the other thing I was going to say with um painful dogs is that actually mental stimulation 
is good for them because you can't in instead of physical stimulation if you like or like you said more gentle little walks but actually we know that um by doing these games we are providing a distraction as well from from the pain sometimes and that can be really useful for yeah. dogs and really you know help their mood and just keep them uh, from thinking about how painful they are i suppose but hopefully they wouldn't be in that much pain because you would have taken them to the vets or, or your physio or your multimodal approach to your arthritic dog and, and trying to get on top of it as, as best you can. Um, yeah, so I think that it's really important. I'm glad you agree that, you know, mental stimulation is, is really, really important. Um, my other question that I get a lot and that I find it a little bit difficult to um, explain this to owners is I, when you examine a dog and you think there may be a bit of arthritis here, there's no lameness necessarily, but you're just seeing, you feel like their walk is a little bit different. And I think it's much easier for me as a vet who doesn't see your dog every day to appreciate changes in, in gait and, and how they look compared to if you're seeing your dog every day. Um, but I find it hard sometimes to convince owners that there may be something going on that we need to start looking a little bit into. And, you know, they'll say, he still comes upstairs every, every time I walk upstairs, he's with me. He still jumps into the car. I mean, how would how would you explain those behaviours and and say, yeah, they, even though they're doing that, they could still be in pain. Why do they do those? That's, that's a really good question. I think sometimes I, have, I look at it from the other side of it, from a behaviour coin side. In terms of if I go to a client's house and I may want them, I'd like them to use a muzzle, and they go, "Oh, my dog's not aggressive. It doesn't need a muzzle." I think it's a similar kind of thing, trying to t uh, convince people or like trying to show them, um, "I'd like you to do something," and they may not want to do it, or they yeah. might be having different thoughts about it. So, what a couple of different approaches I take to that is um, the first one is uh, us, um, either as a vet, as a vet professional, as a behaviour professional, is to read the. Human human's body or be listening to what the human's doing verbally and for their body so as you start saying things and you might mention i could be pain and the person goes oh really um, or they go oh yeah no 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 he's fit and healthy not, suddenly yeah. um if you don't know that client well and that's the first time you're meeting them or something or you go well they're generally not giving me many verbal replies they're not they're not very com uh, they're not very communicative then you start going they've just said no it's not pain and now you're gonna say actually it is so you're, I think it is, saying, yeah. you're wrong and or we're essentially we're saying you're wrong or maybe they start going oh they're saying that i don't know my dog and we don't know yeah. what they're thinking but there could be all these things that people are thinking while we're having this conversation so sometimes if i hear that person go oh no no my dog's fine then i might go Okay, I'm, I'm just going to leave that for a moment and just see what else I can do in that consult or what else I can talk about and see if I can get the client on board in any way. So sometimes while, while I move on to another activity or we talk about something else or we do something else um, and I'm communicating with the client, what often happens is you, the client's talking to you, they say something or they might go... Um, or they might sit if they're standing up they might sit down and they might go oh my arthritis or something and suddenly you find maybe a little in way based on yeah. what, they've said or what they've done and or usually as the consult goes on and you've found something to connect over which isn't the pain aspect of it but there could be under you, you go oh why so why did you get a rottweiler and they go oh i've always had rotties i think they're great um loyal dogs and you go yeah i know i just i remember when i had my child with rottweiler and they're like oh you're a rotty person too and um and now suddenly if you say oh yeah so um i think um it may be worth i know um it may not be pain or um i know your dog still jumps in the car but sometimes with dogs because they love us and they want to go for their walks that they've been on every single day they'll do it without thinking but later on you almost go oh we I wouldn't have done that because now I'm in a bit more pain and so yeah. some, like I'll do things and um, I don't think about what it's going to cause the effects it's going to have later on but then later on you go I wish I wouldn't have done that and like yeah. I might say to my client is go has there been any times where sometimes you would do something and you go oh I just wish I wouldn't have pulled my back now or I, I need to yes. be a bit careful with my back and so sometimes I find clients are more likely to do that and then also I think of it for me it's always a long game um, and so rather than a short game so if I see a client um, and if I offend them or if I make them feel like um, I'm not listening to them, they're not going to come back or they're not mm. going to, when they come back, they already got barriers up. So it may be that in this consult, 
yes, the dog might be in early signs of pain or they might be in pain, but you've either got a choice. You've either got an animal with the client who goes, um, they're not going to do it anyway, um, or they're not going to do anything in that moment. So rather than kind of go, well, I made my point, what is our goal? Is our goal to make a point and be right? Or is our goal to help the animal? If the goal is yeah. to help the animal, we might go. The best thing to do in this situation is not go on about the pain have it in your notes and have oh, it ethically um go there is just something i mean we may need to keep an eye on but set yourself up for the future so the next mm -hmm. point when the client comes back in um they actually you built a rapport and that rapport can start going to other avenues that weren't available to you previously yeah yeah so like you say it kind of applies to a lot of behaviors you just build don't you yeah. build on it so yeah that's really good advice actually just to yeah, bring it in slowly. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to go a few. I'm, I'm just aware that we've got loads and loads of questions here. <laughs> um, but I do want to uh, also, I I did mention to you last week about your um, bucket game. Oh, uh, yeah. Because we had um, Mike Shikashio on earlier on in the year and he mentioned it. And yeah. then after I've spoken to you about it, um, there was a comment on another live saying, oh, I use Chirag's bucket game when I'm trying to clip the hair in between my dog's feet. So I do want to come back to that. But um, I just want to go through a few of these things. Um, da, 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 da. There was one thing about everyone, so everyone saying, yeah, good point about giving them choice and having the conversation with them. There was something about a, a rucksack walk which I'm not sure somebody was asking what is a rucksack walk is that something that you've spoken about before no okay that's fine this might be just from another comment that they've been talking uh, about okay. <laughs> on here a number um, of things, but yeah 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 that's fine we are, i will find out for the people that have asked that um because I'm, I'm not quite sure um but i did see a couple of things up here so there were things somebody mentioned about using some of the stuff that you've said about the licky mats and bringing your mats in um somebody mentioned about using scent work which i think is a really good mental stimulation and we have had um, we have spoken about that on on cam there's brilliant live mm -hmm. uh, that we did end of last year around uh, about scent work and um, so definitely that i think that's a really good activity for mental stimulation low impact on joints and we also spoke to people about man trailing and um canine hoopers as well which i'm still trying to do with my dog but it's just taking a lot longer because she's not actually well it's probably an owner thing rather than the dog thing um but yeah those are all really good mental stimulation things that you can do um puzzle dog da, 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 da. right so we've got a question here from vicky and it says our dog has bilateral hip dysplasia and became a frustrated great more really? frustrated with other dogs due to protecting her back end um do you find do, have you come across that does that i mean it sounds like a perfectly normal behavior if you're painful yeah so um people like the label for straight greeter generally tends to um in my experience um people like people use labels in different ways but one of the ways i hear people use frustrated greeter is a dog who barks and lunges um and they want to move towards the other dog or say hello to the other dog potentially as opposed to aggress when they get to there to get away um and so um i could understand that if you want to see a doggy friend and you're at the end of a lead or you get excited and your muscles tense up potentially that could be painful or if you start to pull on lead or the other dog comes running and you have to readjust your body very quickly then that could be painful so then when you see a dog potentially start to fidget more you start to bark you start to start becoming barky or screamy at the end of a lead and that, that might not make sense but if you follow the trail up i can definitely see like a path that could explain that logically so yeah 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 definitely makes sense um we've got a question here from stefania with a rescue dog cooper who has perhaps lived with pain for about six years or so and thinks it is normal are there any different signs to look for so i i guess that kind of means more of acute as it becomes a, a more it's a chronic pain and then you get maybe acute flare-ups or do you find behavior changes with acute flare-ups so i would say um some of the things we've talked about already like slowing down and even changing routines a little bit so um you're like doing the free work that you talked about with Gemma. you start to go oh the dog's avoiding this so the dog doesn't go on this or you go the dog always gets on the sofa um in a certain way so if you video the dog jumping on the sofa and slow it down and watch what the dog actually does you might go 
oh, that's actually a weird way of, you can see the dogs are um, missing, a, a sk a skipping a little bit as the dog jumps up. So what you can do is sometimes, um, if you're used to seeing the dog show, um, living in a certain way and showing their signs of pain in a certain way, you might not be conditioned to see it in other ways. So sometimes mm -hmm. video and showing it to a friend or showing it to someone else, they'll see it with new eyes and they might see things you don't see. So sometimes asking your friends or a trainer just to go, what do you think of this video and how my dog's moving? And when they say something, rather than going, oh, no, my dog doesn't do that, sometimes we don't necessarily see it. So yeah. take time to maybe show other people. Um, yeah. And then, um, like I say, just starting to slow down and look at how you put the lead on, how you feed, how you groom your dog, all those little things. When you slow down, you start watching, um, you start seeing things that you might not have seen before. So that would be my biggest recommendation. Yeah, yeah. Because I think if you've got a painful dog and you're used to managing it, um, it is all about you don't just stay, stay at one level do you you have to keep evolving with the pain and and changing the way you are all the time and um, there's a question here from trish saying i, I think it's the question is it okay to let your dog lay down to eat and add a, a rug next to their bowl i mean i, I would say if, if that's the way they're most comfortable then probably yeah the, you yeah. don't have to eat in a certain way that's that sounds quite reasonable for to do that um talking about beds a buy harness that does not require yeah that's a good point andrea there you can buy harnesses that don't require the dog to lift their legs and that might be something yeah if you're noticing that they're they're not enjoying you putting that harness on and i guess that could even manifest as the dog doesn't want to go out for a walk because they know that in order to get out for a walk they're going to have to have that harness on so that the harness issue or the pain in one leg could present in different ways it might not just happen when you're putting the harness on might it exactly no i think that's so, a great point but yeah um a harness, there are harnesses around that you can you can use without having to lift them up um yeah got a quite uh, well a comment here from hannah people often don't lift their small dogs or puppies appropriately they will often if lift them by the armpits which is highly inappropriate and could lead to a lot of pain yeah, and it might be that when you do whatever age your dog is, if you lift them up in a certain way, this is something that that owners come in as the presenting sign, I find sometimes. Um, and they say, oh, I pick my dog up as I normally do, and she yelped or she tried to bite me. And I don't know why, it's such a, such a sudden change. And that always screams pain to me. I think, well, we, have, we are going to find some pain in this dog because it's there, I know it's there somewhere. If it's completely out of the blue. Um, but yeah, I mean, picking your dog up, and when you know they're arthritic, it's another thing to think about, isn't it? So how do you recommend, if anyone's listening, what, as a vet, what do you recommend when people pick their puppies up or their dogs up? Well, puppies, I'm more of a scooper. Um, so I, I try not to just lift them up like that. I find it quite, um, well, ideally, I'd like dogs just to walk in with me. Um, but especially with, so there are a couple of painful dogs that I have, um, um, acupuncture dogs that come in. Um, and they do just need a little bit of help sometimes onto the scales. Um, and I do lift them um, and scoop them or I get two people so that we can really try and, and hold them as comfortable as, as possible for them. Because, you know, you, every every dog is individual and every dog's going to be different, aren't they, as to how they, they want to be picked up. What would you recommend? Uh, so, yeah, I would just generally say supporting their back and their front so that, like you say in the example here, you haven't just got animals that are dangling down. Um, yeah. And so you're supporting their back end and their front end as you pick them up. Um, and um, yeah, just to think about if your dog's getting older um, and certain body parts are more sore, then um, can you, rather than picking them up to go in the car, would a ramp or would yeah. some collapsible stairs be more comfortable? Um, so what other options do you have available that saves you? Sometimes picking up the dog saves your back, but also can make it more comfortable for the dog as well. Or the help them up harnesses, they're amazing yeah. as well use them i think you know some some people come in and um they may have been uh, on the cam website or they've done their research and they think oh you know i live on the third floor here of flats and there's no way i can escape stairs and I, i'm going to kill my dog because we have to do stairs three times a day to go to the toilet and you think well, they, there's loads you can do in a harness you could really help them you can take a lot of that weight can't you and just really really help and and you might find then actually your dog that did not want to come down the stairs did not want to go for a walk and was peeing in the house because they really didn't want to have to battle those stairs suddenly it becomes a much more enjoyable experience again so so yeah it's a good point think about it how, whatever you can do to help help your dog um 
they want to uh yeah no this is a com this is a tricky one what about altering dogs behavior and routines once they're on an adequate pain management regimen regimen and they feel better so they want to over exercise because they aren't in pain anymore what would you say about that for me, I, I tend to look at, again, keeping a diary. So going, um, so if I take my dog on a forest walk for this long, um, how does that change their behavior afterwards? So are they more sore when they sleep or getting up from bed or do they just go home and just they just shattered the whole time and they don't get up until the next day? Um, and then maybe I want to look at, okay, that might not be such a good thing because then I'm putting a lot of maybe pressure on one side of the dog um, as opposed to balancing out their routine. Now, I'm not talking um, like there might be a day where um, I don't know you play with a friend and you don't want to take away all their fun but you, you're kind of balancing out welfare and giving them those happy moments and smile moments or finding ways to add in as many smile moments for our dogs as possible but also yeah. not putting them in the extra distress or um, extra discomfort so i think um i tend to like not saying you never let your dogs have fun or anything but find ways to have fun which are more balanced and like you've talked about scent work and other things that dogs can do so i would say keep a diary and monitor um how, what routines work for your dog and it could be they change um when the weather changes or they change when um i don't know if you have a routine where um your kids are at home and the kids are not at home because they're at school some of the times and again they want to play with the dog then you have to balance all those factors in so you go okay so based on these routines what is the, how's the dog behaving differently on these different days and if you've got a dog at home so if you've got uh, people at home more people at home over the weekends then it may mean that where the dog normally jumps on the couch and sits but because everyone's on the couch watching playing the playstation watching tv the dog doesn't get access to the softest or the most comfortable yeah area so in the weekend the dog might be uh, more uh painful or might be more uh, stubborn um in the week um, on monday because yeah. uh, when you say sit and the dog doesn't sit it could be because the weekend they just spent lying on the floor and that's quite being bad or uh, like not as comfortable for their joints and so when you notice those changes i'm a big fan of keeping those diaries because that can really give you clues as to what's going on yeah yeah and i think it also goes back to what you said at the beginning um about dogs that we control everything really about their lives don't we and so if we know something's not good then it's up to us to alter that that routine or that exercise pattern and recognize that maybe they can't do that i think we need um, to stop, like we need to change the way we label uh what we do with dogs so i remember listening to a dr susan friedman who talks about um animals and people and people as caregivers and I, that's really stuck with me so i use the word caregiver a lot and i know other trainers use slightly different words like guardians or something else but the reason i like caregiver is rather than thinking of myself as an owner um it's like i own this property or i own this if i'm a caregiver of a dog then what is it that i how do i provide best care how do i care for my dog and that's what we're essentially doing because we're taking yeah. these beings that don't have um that don't have very much control because we take it um, away with how we ask them to live and when we feed them and stuff we think how can i be a better caregiver what do we, how can i be watching and um just something i wanted to mention before we go on as well just uh, broke down um uh, because i see it a lot is with humans we often think about adjusting our pain uh, medication or um, working with our doctors to adjust our pain medication whereas with dogs there's almost this kind of like um press the button and it's done so you, your dog's in pain you go to the vets you get some treatment and your dog's not in pain anymore but mm -hmm. when, uh, when they come for a behavior consult and we're talking about going back and they're like no no i've been to the vets it's fine um I, it would be interesting to see your opinion because for me it's almost your pain is not just one thing like you said it's so yeah. different so you might have gone to the vet but you might need to go back to the vet over a number of weeks or every couple of months because you need to adjust pain medication yeah. Yeah. depending on days and depending as the dog progresses what's going on so i think that's a key thing to also talk to with our clients is um about how it's not just about come back come here once and you're done as your yeah, dog it's not a fix yeah, you're right. If you were a person, you would be going for regular checks. And we we, we love people to do that. And mm -hmm. um, the ones that we see most frequently are the ones that come in for a therapy every month or every week. Um, and I do feel like often I will adjust what we're doing. And, and sometimes it's, it's the opposite way. You're not adding. Sometimes we're taking things away or reducing because actually we're doing better because the physio has been added or, um, you know, the laser therapy has been working. So or the behaviorist has made some changes to their routine and, and it's made a massive difference. So yeah, it's really important to keep in touch and keep talking to all these people, all these caregivers um, that are, are trying to help you with, with your dog. Yeah. Um, and, uh, so, can I just mention one other thing? Um, yeah. 
like if there's any vets listening because sometimes when i'm working with vets they'll ask um like how can we a lot of times clients don't come back for follow-up visits or yes. they think my dog's on pain medication he's fine i don't need to go back so one of the things we've tried a few practices i've worked with is we call them um like treat visits or um or geriatric parties or um a pain a pain party you can, we can call it whatever you want yeah we, um like it's part we're, we're gonna do as it's, it's a visit where we do something nice when our dogs are not feeling so good and so essentially it's a follow-up visit but for the vet it allows them to get data to examine the dog and to be able to just monitor what's going on but for the clients from the moment the dog walks in there's maybe lots a little treat party um there's nice things happen um and like you say people tend to come back for therapies like if they if you're going to do something where if it's just a follow-up it's like oh they're not really going to do anything um or the dog uh, the dog seems fine i don't want to pay that little bit of money whereas if you come in and there's an event so it's like we're gonna uh, we're gonna play with the dog or we're going to teach you a little game or we're going to do some scent work or we're going to actually do something and it could be just a fun little training gate a little training task um what yeah. often happens is clients go my dog really loved going and he went and they'll tell the people our friends at the park went to the vets and um they spent this much time giving my dog treats he loved it was so happy and what it does for the vets is it sets the dog up for the future visit because yeah. they're in pain yeah into the vets potentially and having manipulations or having treatments is going to be more painful now and so more punishing so yeah. what it does with older dogs is it actually sets them up uh, you're putting some money in the trust accounts and treats in the trust accounts so the future visits are more likely to be go well and you yeah. get less aggressive behavior and less stressful behaviors as well so like just turning that around a little bit can be really useful yeah and i think that's one thing that we um in, well we encourage pre-covid um, all dogs to come in and have positive experiences, but especially the ones that are in, in pain yeah. would be great. But, you know, I love it when people just call in just to say hi and get a treat from reception and go on the scales because weight is such a massive thing for all dogs, but especially our arthritic ones. Um, and it just, like you say, you're building that little bit of trust and putting a bit of cash in the trust pocket. And um, and then, yeah, hopefully they don't mind when they do have to come in and, and have something happening. But if you only come in once a year and they hate it, then they're always going to hate it, aren't they? And especially if they're in pain, it's going to be even worse. Um, I, we have got loads of questions, but I really wanted to just touch on, um, and I wanted people to go and have a look at this bucket game. So can you please just tell us a little bit about your bucket game? Because I think when I saw that somebody was using it to, uh, it's kind of about having a conversation with your dog still, isn't it? And giving them space. So I'll shut up. Can you just explain it? <laughs> yeah, sure. So um, for the bucket game, I tend to use a bucket. That's why it's called the bucket game. Um, and um, I used to, you can use any container. Uh, but what we start off by doing is placing some treats in there, but it could be a toy, it could be something else. And we teach the dog, um, as we bring this down slowly towards um, towards their level, the dog can just look at it calmly. So it's not about putting it in front of their nose and snatching it away because the dog's trying to put the head in, but we teach it in small steps. And um, I'll have to do a, like a, a webinar series on how to actually train it. But like th that's a key point. So I just want to uh, kind of emphasize that because a lot of times people go, well, it's kind of just a leave it exercise. It's not because we're training it in a way that there's minimal frustration and the dog's really calm and the dog's just learn. I keep nice and calm when this comes down. Now, when the dog's looking at the bucket, they can be in a sit down or a stand, whatever's most comfortable for the dog. So I bring the bucket out, the dog goes, oh, there's a bucket, I'm just gonna focus towards it. Um, now when they're looking, it's not about, I just need to stay intently, it's just, I'm here, the bucket's there, I'm gonna look towards the bucket, but if a noise happens over here, I can still see it. Um, so you want the dog to be relaxed enough that they're still fully aware of how they, the, the body sensations, how they feel and what's going on around. Now, once that's happened, what I tend to do is when I bring the bucket out, I just hold it. There's no command. So there's no look at this, do this. I just hold it. When the dog chooses to look, I just start to move my hand a little bit. If the dog looks towards my hand, then I tend to uh, just stop moving my hand. When the dog looks at the bucket, I pay them for looking at the bucket. They get a treat out of the bucket. But then um, as my hand moves, if they're still looking at the bucket, I give them a treat. So what happens is the dog starts to learn. If I look at the hand or I turn my head away from the bucket, the person stops doing what they're doing. And that hand move, that movement starts becoming an ear touch or a groom, or it could be a blood draw, or it could be anything voluntary. And the dog basically starts to learn when the bucket's out, I get to choose when I'm ready and look at it. And then if I want the person to stop, I just look away and the person stops. So There's a clear communication for um, the caregiver and the dog between the dog. And the dog has a very clear way of saying, Oh, I'd like you to stop. Okay, can you carry on? 
Mm. We also have, um, so if the dog stops, we, that tells us that maybe the dog's saying that's too much. Um, so um, that's information. So the next time you go to touch the ear or you go to touch a body part, you, maybe you, you do it in smaller steps. And so the dog's more comfortable. So when the dog does say, I don't want you to do that, or they stop, that's just information for us to do it differently. Um, so we can work at the dog's uh, pace, essentially. And the dog has a voice. And when the dog has a voice, they don't feel the need to sort of growl or um, essentially get aggressive aggressive um, and then if the dog does look away sometimes I will just give them a treat for looking away as well so it's not that you only get treats for looking at the bucket so you get a treat again for looking away so it's not that I have to keep staring at the bucket and when I train um, the game, I also do have like a, a Kong filled with something. Or I'll have a chew or something of, uh, available in the environment. So if the dog wanted to just walk away and do that instead, they could. And it, all it does is make, it makes you have to be a better trainer because you have to make it way more fun. Um, yeah. And work on everything to be to there. The dog here as opposed yeah, to just yeah. doing the other things. So that's a really quick um, sort of... Um, the idea behind the bucket game right. um, but you can use it for so many like if i go to the vets and i pull out the bucket the dog's like oh we're playing that game so it's not like oh my god i'm at the scary vet but i'm at a, i'm playing a game which is about safety yeah and predictability and control and if you've got a dog that has learned that when the hand goes towards your paw it feels uncomfortable what this does is because there's a different um cue um you're giving the dog you're training in a slightly different way Hmm. And this, you've got a video on your website as well, haven't you? About yeah, just a slight introduction. It doesn't give that much detail, but I, I will start to like. Um, I'm, I'm actually working on creating a little webinar series or train live series over the uh, next few months, so people can, uh, we can discuss little steps and people can practice it with their dogs, and then each week we can do a bit more. So we'll work through the whole bucket game thing. So if anyone's interested, they can keep an eye on my Facebook page, um, and I'll post details on there. Yeah, that would be brilliant because I, I, I it makes perfect sense and it because you think yeah you want to communicate with your dog and you want to hear what they're saying and listen to them but if it's something as simple as that well it does obviously it's not simple we have to build it up um but that is really really giving the power back to the dog then isn't it and then you it, you just understand and hopefully you, it's also a bonding experience for you and your dog and, yeah. and just building on, on your relationship all the time so, yeah, thank you for that. I think that um, describes it really well. Um, so I know we, we're coming, we're over an hour now, and I know people will probably be wanting to go and eat their dinner or have their evening glass of wine or whatever they do in, the, in their lockdowns. Um, but I will go through all, all of these questions and, and, and try and answer them. And, of course, we will now beg um, Chirag to come back and talk to us another time as well. I'd love um, to. <laughs> um, and, and he's always... Um, you know, learning stuff and, um, you know, building on and also having an arthritic dog yourself. It's obviously something that you're exploring a little bit more now as well, isn't it? Yeah, I'm um, actually, well, I found the, um, on the CAM website, um, I was actually, because I want to learn more, Cody's 12 and he's got arthritis and also just generally helping my clients. Um, I found that there was a course on, I went on the CAM's website and so I signed up for it and it's called, I think, CAM Advocate. Um, yeah. And it's a really cool course. Like I signed up for it. And there's little video clips and um, little seminars, and you can work through them all the way through. Um, and it's yeah, I found it so amazing. Like I'm working through it at the moment, yes. and it's just picking up lots of different tips. Um, yeah. And there's lots of resources. Like in the, when I'm doing the course, it's like oh, there's this handout you could use to monitor this or score this. And I was like oh my god, that's gonna be so useful to keep a track of um, like how Cody might be feeling in a certain situation, how much pain he's in. Or when I'm working with a client now, I've started to recommend some of those resources. So I would highly recommend for anyone out there, if they haven't seen it, to go check out um, the course that you guys offer because um, I found it really, really useful. Good, good. Yeah, and, and hopefully it's been useful for you to choose your new flooring as well for your house. <laughs> um, we have got a new course coming out um, very soon for um, owners. And Hannah is working on it day and night. She never sleeps. She just carries on. Um, and it's it's supposed to be comprehensive and essential. Um, and that was supposed to be all in one course. Okay. However, she, she found she had far too much to talk about. Um, and it went over far beyond what she wanted it to be. So it's kind of split into two courses now. There's a comprehensive one and a shorter essential one. And they will be launched very soon hopefully um, and then mm -hmm. Hannah can get some sleep um so yeah look out for that we will keep everyone I'll be posted. signing up to that one 
<laughs> Brilliant. So, and I think it's just so much so good, like the information on there to help with not only my own dog, but just as a trainer and behaviorist to help with so many other people's yeah. dogs. Um, yeah. I really found it beneficial. So I definitely, I, found, I think the course was great. And I think the more times I like listen to it, the better I get at learning that information. So I think I can't wait. That'll be a really cool course to do. Pick up. Yeah. I mean, we're so lucky on CAM because we just have amazing people that agree to come and speak to us like yourself. And we're, we're just so fortunate and, and grateful because um, it really helps. Because like we say, arthritis is always a, sort of a multimodal approach. And I think, how can you have this many amazing speakers come on and that's just because arthritis is such a massive topic and there's loads to look for and that means that there's loads of places where we can kind of intervene and and make sure that we're doing our best for for our dogs so yeah thank you so much and and i will now um when we sign off i will now get you to agree to come on again so <laughs> thank you everyone for watching and thank you so much Shirag, for, for giving us your time um, have a great evening, everybody, and we will see you again shortly. Take care. Bye.